Hey everybody, it's good to see you. Thanks for showing up. Listen, I've got so much to try to share today that I'm going to be going super fast. I apologize if it's hard to, to hang on. We're going to talk about a whole lot of different subjects. They're kind of connected. And just to make sure that we have room to answer some of your specific questions, I've embedded, I think, four or five different questions within the main body of today's webcast. And we're actually going to open with one of those questions from last week. Now, before we go into this, I want to say two things. I want to make sure I don't forget. Number one, uh, thank you to our dear friends at Rolco Radio. They sent three cases of extremely good wine. So good that I'm not sharing it with clients. I took it to my house. And um, on those evenings when I decided to open a bottle of wine for Penny and I, I opened those and just let me just say, mm, whoever did your wine selection, keep that guy on the job because uh, that person chose some really extraordinary stuff. Thank you very much. Now, number two is... When you send over a script for me to evaluate, I'm always going to use the ones where I think we can make the biggest difference. Now, the upside is um, I will go ahead and send the, my version of what I thought had a lot of room for improvement. I'll send my version over to you, and you can use it if you want to. It's just a gift. Um, but... I'm just doing the best I can with the information that you gave me in the original ad. And this is what's important. Thank you for sending over ads for me to take a look at because real examples are always better than, you know, imaginary concepts. But when I choose the ones where we can make what I feel is a pretty big difference, um, the person who sent the ad can feel a little bit beat up. And that is not my intention. It's my, not my intention to demean you, belittle you, make you feel bad or embarrass you in any way. On the other hand, I do attach the name, usually not the stations, but the name of the person who sent the ad so that everybody knows this is not something that I made up, that this is a real ad, you know, created by real people. And so, be patient with me, don't get your feelings hurt, especially in the heat of the moment if I say something that's a little bit over the top and, and makes you feel beat up, because that, that, that's not my intention. That's not what I'm trying to do. So Sean, let's beat up the first person. Sean, can you have Roy examine this script for the next teleconference at noon on Monday? The client's been running close to optimum effective scheduling, that's OES, optimum effective schedule frequency for eight weeks. Uh, during that time, their call frequency was flat in January, down in February. Mm. Do you have any advice on how we can improve the ad and increase call activity? Yes, we do have some advice. First, <clears throat> let's look at that script. It says, a message from Guardian Alarm, 1-800-STAY-OUT. Guardian Alarm, a certified pure Michigan-based company for over 80 years, provides peace of mind from knowing your home or business is monitored locally 24 hours a day. Make it a New Year's resolution to keep your family as safe and secure as possible. Guardian Alarm can protect you and your neighbors, and they ask you not to send your money to Switzerland-based ADT and Brinks, but to keep it right here in Michigan. Think about a new security, thinking about a new security system for your home or business? Guardian's AirLink system sends your signal over a private radio network. No need to worry about cut phone lines or internet trouble to keep your family safe. Guardian customers can remotely control their home or business systems and video cameras from their smartphones. Be smart and safe this new year by protecting your home right now with Guardian Alarm. You can switch to Guardian for free and save 20% or more on your monitoring fees and Guardian, Guardian Alarm services all their customers the same day. Call Guardian Alarm today at 1-800-STAY-OUT for a free no-obligation appointment. That's 1-800-STAY-OUT or online at guardianalarm.com. Now, that ad tries to make way too many points. It says way too many things. And when you start looking, there's really only one thing kind of in there that has some teeth. Now let's go down this um, a little bit, Sean, go back to the script and we'll show them uh, specifically at the top, uh, a message from Guardian Alarm. Now, by announcing what this is, it basically says, you're about to hear an ad. Uh, don't do that. And then it says, a pure Michigan-based company for over 80 years. Hey, buddy, here's a quarter. Call your mama. Maybe she cares. Nobody cares that you're local. Don't let the client convince you that them being local is, is, is the strongest play they've got. It never is. Number three, it's way too late in the year to talk about New Year's resolutions. 
Um, you talk about New Year's resolutions in the second half of, uh, well, actually in the final week of January. You start talking about New Year's resolutions on December 26th. You quit talking about New, Re New Year's resolutions on about January 8 or 9. After that, it is old news. And the ad sounds very dated. Uh, you and your neighbors. Well, I don't care about protecting my neighbors. They ask you not to send your money to Switzerland-based ADT and Brinks. Here's a problem. The Lanham Act, L-A-N-H-A-M, is a, an act in Congress of the United States. It's a federal law that makes it illegal to say the names of your competitors in your ads, except under some very unusual, very extraordinary circumstances. And so that's illegal. I would never, ever, ever advise anybody to name the competitors in the ads. And it makes you sound defensive when you start naming competitors and saying you're sending your money out of town when you use them. Man, if that's the strongest thing you've got to say, then you must really suck. Now, we're halfway through the ad when we start talking about the first thing that actually might matter. Send your signal over a private radio network. No need to worry about cut phone lines or internet trouble. Okay. Now, we'll move on. We talked about vertical schedules last week. You remember the vertical schedule is when you're trying to create urgency and you're trying to get somebody to do something right now, like call a particular phone room and book an appointment to get a new security system installed. That's what an OES schedule is, Optimum Effective Schedule in Radio. And this is obviously a radio ad. Now, I decided that I'm gonna give you a super quick review of what we talked about last week, flights or announcements of feature and benefits. Now these guys have definitely got a flight going. They've been going on now for about eight weeks, nine weeks, you know, since the first of the year, the first month was flat, and since then it's been down, which frankly doesn't surprise me. Um, <clears throat> ads create the, the flight, you're, you're trying in this schedule for Guardian to create relevance and credibility. Where's your relevance gonna come from? Why does, why does this move the needle on the who gives a crap meter? and where's the credibility going to come from, and how can we trash the competitors without saying their name. Number, the next thing, I promise I talked about three steps to clear communication. Now you gotta be really careful not to get these out of order. The first thing to do is figure out how to end. What are you gonna leave as the last mental image in the mind of the listener? How to end, that is step number one. Not where to end, but how, how, how. How do we get off the stage? How do we end this ad elegantly? Now, how to end. The second thing you decide is where to begin. You've got to choose a really interesting angle of approach. So remember, you're writing to an ending. Know how the ad ends. Know how it ends. Know what it is you're going to leave people with. And it's not just a phone number. It's got to be a picture much bigger than a phone number. It's got to be a motivation much more compelling than a phone number. And then where to begin. And then what to leave out. Ah, what am I going to leave out? I'm going to leave out wah, 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 Michigan-based, wah, 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 wah. Stand by for an announcement from Guardian Alarm. Um, now, be careful not to get these things out of order. Let me read to you the ad that I'm going to send um, our friend for Mr. Cohen for, for sending in the ad that's obviously not working as well as they should. A criminal is coming to your house tonight. All he has to do is snip the telephone line or the cable that carries your internet signal and bingo. Your security system is completely defeated. He chose your house because you have that cute little sign that tells him your system did not come from Guardian Alarm. He can't defeat a Guardian Alarm, and he knows it. A Guardian Alarm communicates over its own private radio network, and Guardian Alarm clients, and Guardian Alarm clients, I messed up, Sean, uh, can control their security systems, home or business, from their smartphones anywhere in the world. Guardian Alarm puts you in complete control. Sleep safe tonight. Call 1-800-STAY-OUT. Not only will you have the only security system crooks cannot defeat, it's usually about 20% less expensive. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? And Guardian Alarm has the best on earth. If you want crooks to stay out, call 1-800-STAY-OUT right now. We'll replace your toy security system with a real one that crooks can't defeat. 1-800-STAY-OUT. Now, I popped the T's, can't defeat, 1-800-STAY-OUT. I did that on purpose. It's a mnemonic cue. It is something that will cause the listener, it's a weird little interruptive kind of a thing. Let's look at that script. A criminal is coming, present tense verb, is coming to your house tonight. And all he has to do is snip 
the telephone line or the cable that carries your internet signal and bingo, your security system is completely defeated. He chose your house because you have that cute little sign that tells him your system did not come from Guardian Alarm. He can't defeat a Guardian Alarm and he knows it. A Guardian Alarm communicates over its own private radio network and Guardian Alarm clients can control their security systems, home or business, from their smartphones anywhere in the world. Guardian Alarm puts you in complete control. Sleep safe tonight. Call 1-800-STAY-OUT. Not only will you have the only security system crooks cannot defeat, it's usually about 20% less expensive. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? And Guardian Alarm has the best on earth. If you want crooks to stay out, call 1-800-STAY-OUT right now. We'll replace your toy security system with a real one that crooks can't defeat. 1-800-STAY-OUT. And that ad should definitely work better than the one you've been running. Hi, Sean. I've taken eight on-site as well as four online academy courses. I've been reading Roy's books and memos for more than a decade. I attend the monthly live seminars. As a participant with all of this, it would appear that two distinct schools of advertising copywriting are promoted at the academy. One, the first school is what I'll refer to as the Just Say the Thing copywriting school. Now, that is what Chris Maddock is famous for teaching, Just Say the Damn Thing. The second school is what I'll call mental image construction via the skillful use of powerful verbs and unique words and unusual combinations. My question, when writing ads, how do you know in advance which approach is best, which, bluntly, will sell the most stuff? That is, when do you just say the thing? And when do you infuse the persuasive power of poetry into your copy and pull the reader in with seductive, colorful mental images? Thank you very much, Ray. And thank you very much, Ray, for the question. I think it's a very insightful question, and I apologize for not being a better, more clear, and concise teacher. Try to answer the question as asked. <sighs> Assuming that the premise of the question is sound, and that there are these two separate uh, things being taught, under that premise, which I, don't, I do not fully accept, I would say the answer is this. When the facts are on your side, present the facts. If you really do have a superior system, go to the facts, just say the thing. We have a private radio network. Ours is the only one that's not a toy. All you have to do to defeat anybody else's is just snip the internet or phone connection. Now, I know that that's probably not true. I think probably all those security companies have got similar, you know, technology. But it's the only thing that I could use that was in the ad you gave me, and frankly, a lot of people will believe it and you get plenty of calls, even if it's not technically accurate. So, yeah, just say the thing if you have a fact that you can present that gives you relevance and credibility. But what if the facts are not on your side? What if you're just trying to make people feel better about you and your company because you have effectively the same product or service that everybody else has? Well, that's when you bluff with fluff. That's when you have to go with um, just making them like you. And that doesn't drive immediate calls. It just doesn't. But I think it's completely naive when advertising people assume that everybody they deal with as a client actually has the right company to buy from. Now, we know the odds are against that. You know, the simple fact is, most of the time, the company that really is the one that you should buy from is not the one you're dealing with. Most of the time, you're dealing with number three, four, five, seven on the list, and you're going to have to come up with something that seems to matter that maybe really doesn't. Hey, we're advertising people. This isn't about finding out who has the actual best product or service and then recommending it as a public service to your audience, is it? So. We're now going to switch. We've talked quickly about how to use a short flight to try to drive some phone calls for Guardian Alarm. Now we're going to talk about how to create a long-term ad campaign. Look just under the A in the word campaign. Do you know who that is? That is the lovely and talented Robert Louis Stevenson, author of Treasure Island. I love Robert Louis Stevenson. He also wrote a thing called Technical Elements of Style in literature about 125 years ago, he said there is nothing more disenchanting to man than to be shown the springs and mechanism of any art. All our arts and occupations lie wholly on the surface. It is on the surface that we perceive their beauty, fitness, and significance. 
And to pry below is to be appalled by their emptiness and shocked by the coarseness of the strings and pulleys. Now, I exposed the coarseness of those strings and pulleys just a few moments ago whenever I said, hey, you're very often not working for the company that the reader, the listener, the viewer really should deal with. And your job is to make them deal with a lesser company and purchase a lesser product or service under the imagined pretense that it really is better. Now the client is always sold on their own company. Sometimes your job is to get sold on their company and you have to delude yourself to do this. And so yes, these are some coarse strings and pulleys and this seems harsh, but it's the truth nonetheless. Now, we're talking about long-term ad campaigns right now. A long-term campaign is a serialized story delivered in regular installments, much like an ongoing TV show. And it's important to know how to craft a story. Traditional ads deliver information to a listener, changing what the listener knows in their head. But a story changes not what they know, but what they think. It causes them to see something maybe they've always known or maybe they've always suspected it. But it gives them a new perspective a new attitude. Now, a story changes how they feel. Our goal is to change how they feel. Stories are built upon choices and consequences. Stories engage the imagination of a listener in a way that mere facts do not. Now, memorable long-term campaigns are built from interesting characters. Number one, consequences depend on choices. What were the consequences in the ad that we just mocked up for Guardian Alarms? Hey, the crook's going to get in your house and get your stuff and maybe hurt you and people that you love. He's coming to your house tonight, and he's laughing at your toy security system. All he's got to do is interrupt your phone line or your internet access, and you're just screwed. Now, our credibility is we have this private radio network, you see. Consequences depend upon choices. You chose the wrong alarm. Different characters make different choices and experience different consequences. Ah. The people with the toy alarm, they have the little sign that say, hit this house, they have a toy system. And then the people who made a different choice, and the little sign says, don't even try this, because you know you can't defeat it. A character's choices are determined by that character's core values. Now here's what's interesting about long-term campaigns. These characters have an attitude, a belief system, embedded traits that dictate how this spokesperson thinks, acts, and sees the world. How they think, act, and see the world. You remember this from last month. These are known as their character diamond. Now the most interesting characters, now I'm talking about interesting characters, have a minimum of three highly polarized characteristics that form this diamond. Think of it as a triangle or a baseball diamond, a square up on its point. These core values seem on the surface to be inconsistent with one another. That's what I mean by highly polarized. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to create a character this complex or this interesting in every ad campaign on the TV or radio. But I'm just talking about imaginary characters as tools. The most interesting characters have the most polarized character diamonds. Now you'll remember I gave you very quickly last month Gregory House and we decided that he was an antisocial jerk, he was a diagnostic genius, and he was a drug addict. That is the character diamond of Gregory House. These three points, and there have to be at least three. The brand diamond is created by connecting the dots of the defining characteristics of your company. Ah, the brand diamond. You see, a brand is an entity. It's, an, it's a fictional entity. It is a person with a personality, the same as any other fictional character. Okay. Now, Wayne O'Brien asked, Roy, on the TV campaign you showed last month, did you use a three frequency and how did you achieve it? One station, many stations, every day or certain days, why did you choose TV for this client rather than radio? Good question, Wayne. Now, for those of you that were with us a month ago, I showed you uh, Bobby and Mr. Jenkins sitting in a heat and air conditioning truck, approaching midnight, waiting for the phone to ring. So the premise is the owner of this very big company is sitting here waiting for somebody to need service done at any time prior to midnight and it's the same price as the daytime. Now, other companies can't match that. And so we looked at some of those TV ads and Wayne asked some good questions. Number one, why did you choose TV? Well, Wayne, we didn't. 
Simple fact is, the client's been coming to the academy for a number of years, uh, has been a great student, has built the company very, very big by himself. And then he built it to the, what, what we call the length of his own shadow. He got to the limit of his own ability. Now, we were paid to, to come in and evaluate it. We looked at it really hard and I realized, I'm gonna change his message a lot and I'm probably gonna change his media plan a lot. And this guy is not an idiot. He's done a very good job and it's been very effective for years. Thank you, Sean. For been very effective for years. And I made a judgment call. I said, can I make a big difference just changing the message and leave the media plan in place? Because if I change both simultaneously, he's going to get really nervous, really, really, really anxious. Because it isn't broken, you see. It had been working. And so when somebody's been doing something and it's working just fine, and they've grown and grown and grown and grown and grown, putting all their money on television, and you're going to take them to the next level, it's hard to convince them, well, you've been doing it completely wrong. But yet that's what a lot of advertising professionals try to do. I made the decision, I can do more just by changing his message than I can by changing his media. At the end of a year or two, he'll go, wow, you guys have taken this to a whole new level. He will relax. He's completely sold on the message already, frankly, after 90 days or so. And uh, maybe change the media. Maybe not. Who cares? So remember, and this is maybe the slide, Wayne, that you missed last month. Television must have impact. You're not going to get frequency on TV. You're just not. It's radio that requires repetition. Radio is a repetition media. Television is an impact media. You got to make sure that what they're seeing on television is going to move them in some way, intellectually or emotionally, and it's going to do it with only one repetition if they just see it one time. Now, are we reaching the average viewer in his city more than once? Absolutely. And it's very simple. It's called a horizontal schedule. I think we're on every network news channel the late evening news. Usually it's like 10 o'clock news. So the 10 o'clock news for all the network news stations every night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe even Saturdays, I can't remember. If you watch that, you know, most people, they watch the news, they watch the same station every night. And you're going to catch it at least three nights out of five, I'm betting, if you watch the news. And so do we get a three frequency? Yeah, probably. But it's not essential on television. Completely horizontal schedule on television. You don't pick stations, you pick shows. Pick the same show. And so when you're on the same show every time it airs, you're likely to catch the same viewer repetitiously. Now, Wayne asks a follow-up question. He says, on newspaper advertising, is it better to stay with one ad until it dies? Or is it better to use more than one at a time and rotate them? Should, new should a newspaper ad be used to tell a story or something else? Ah, again. I'm going to try to answer the question as asked. Now, if I'm going to answer it based upon the premise being accurate, I would say, no, don't use a newspaper to tell a story. Um, people, when they're reading a newspaper, they're looking for short-term, high-impact information. What's happening, what's happening right now that I need to know about. Believe it or not, when something is a limited time offer, special event, it's only going to be available today or tomorrow or for a very brief window of time. Um, that's when you put it in the news paper because it's news and it's not going to be true forever. And so, no, I don't usually tell stories in newspaper ads. Now, I said I'm going to answer the question as asked, accepting the premise of the question, and, and I've done that, hopefully. And though the first part of that question was, do you stay with the same ad until it dies? Um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an old school of thought that says, when do you change the ad? When it quits working. That, that's when you change it. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's a little bit twitchy in my mind because you're just jumping from one short-term miracle to the, hoping to find another short-term miracle to replace that one. And, and those campaigns tend to run out of steam pretty quickly because you're always looking for the high impact, quick, 
drive them to the telephone or through the front door or whatever. And after a while, it's the little boy that's crying wolf, wolf, wolf. So I can agree with it, run it until it quits working, but sometimes when it quits working, you've pretty well exhausted that, that readership or audience anyway. And so, <clears throat> yeah, um, the fundamental premise, though, that I disagree with is that there is necessarily a completely different way to think about media delivery vehicles. And now that I answered the question in, in the style that you asked it uh, under that premise, let me just say that I, I think it's always about what you say. And, and, and the vehicle of the saying, the vehicle of the, the, the message delivery, the media itself, is completely and entirely secondary. Now we're going to talk a little bit later about psychological environment. But ultimately your psychological environment doesn't depend entirely on the media that delivers the message. Um, psychological environment is a much more specific and much more important than the vehicle of delivery. Now, what is branding really? This is a super quick review for those that have never seen it before, for those that have seen it, for those that haven't seen it. Do you know who won the Nobel Prize for discovering branding in 1904? Well, that would be good old Ivan Pavlov. He rubbed a meat paste on the tongue of a dog as he rang a bell. The dog began to associate the sound of the bell with the taste of meat. Voila, branding was born. All Pavlov had to do after a few weeks was ring a bell. The dog would begin to salivate even if there was no meat. He implanted an associative memory in combination with a recall cue. Now, what is an associative memory. It's a memory that has become linked to another memory. Now whenever a person sees those words, a spoonful of sugar, I didn't say them with the cadence, I didn't say them at all, and I certainly didn't do it with the rhythm or the cadence that would have triggered uh, just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, but usually in any large audience all I have to do is show those words on the slide, bam, at least two-thirds or three-quarters of the people will raise their hand when I say, how many of you were thinking about Mary Poppins as soon as you saw those words? That's an example of an associative memory. Now a recall cue is simply a mental trigger which prompts the reader, the listener, the viewer, the prospective customer to take a prescribed action at an appointed time. There are three keys to doing this. If you're going to implant an associative memory, in, memory into the mind of the customer, if you want your company to be the one they think of first and the one they feel the best about whenever they need or whenever anybody in their realm of association needs what you sell. When they or any of their friends, family, co-workers, neighbors need what you sell. If you want to have involuntary automatic recall, you must plant associative memories into the mind of the customer. Specifically, you're going to go past working memory, which is the RAM, the short-term electrical memory in the biological computer called the brain. You're going to go even deeper than semantic and episodic declarative memory, which is midterm. You're going all the way to what's called procedural memory, which is long-term chemical recall. Automatic involuntary memory. Conditioned response. Ah, Pavlov, true branding. The first key is consistency. Everybody figures out the first key on their own. Always associate the recall cue with the response you're desiring. Number two is frequency. Pavlov did this day after day after day. He did not come out at the end of a few weeks and say, oh, this isn't working. We must be reaching the wrong dog. He didn't worry about whether or not he was targeting the right dog. He worried about making sure that he was talking to the dog in the language of the dog about what matters to the freaking dog. When implanting an associative memory, the recall cue, in Pavlov's case, the recall cue was the sound of a bell. It must be associated with a memory which is already anchored in the mind. In this case, it is the dog's love for the taste of meat. Frequency and consistency create branding. Frequency and consistency create automatic, involuntary recall. Only when your message is tied to an already established emotional anchor. Pavlov's branding campaign was anchored to the dog's love for the taste of meat. If the dog didn't love meat, the frequent and consistent ringing of Bedell would produce no response other than to irritate the dog. Now listen, most people are irritating the dog. The dog says, hey, would you shut up with the bell already? I hate advertising. Well, gosh, dog, does it always have to be about you? <laughs> yeah, I'm a dog. Well, dog, uh, you, you don't care that we're local and that you're keeping your money in the community? Uh, no, not, 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 not really so much. No, not at all. And, uh, it, you know, by the way, uh, in the ad for, for the first ad, the original ad for, for Guardian Alarm, 
We named the company and the phone number before we gave them any reason to care. Don't ever do that. Don't ever go into the language of ad speak, which is all the information that you would need to know to contact us if you actually gave a crap. Don't assume they give a crap. Do not open with anything other than the taste of meat. What is it the customer actually cares about? What is their motivation? What makes the reader, the listener, the viewer think, act, and see the world as they do? And you need a spokesperson who gets in step with that. You need a spokesperson, you need an ad, you need a script, you need a voice to get in step with the taste of meat in the heart of the dog. The customer is the dog. Now, will your recall cue, will your slogan, your positioning statement, or other repetitious element in your advertising be tied to an anchor in the heart of your customer, or will you just irritate the dog? Please don't irritate the dog. Now, Shift gears with me. <clears throat> I was thinking about metabolism, recalling the high voltage days when I was indestructible. Do you remember those days when you could just vaporize calories on contact? Now a thought strolled across my brain, the white hot furnace of youth. This is a game that I play with myself. Professional writers play word games. I spent uh, last Wednesday with some guys that um, created, the original creators and the current uh, stewards, if you will, of the roughly 30-year-old, um, not quite 30 years old, but close to it, uh, Tom Baudet campaign for Motel 6. You know the Tom Baudet ads for Motel 6. You know, that campaign is still alive and still winning awards. Now, the guy that created the original campaign was there. His name's Thomas, wonderful fellow about my age, maybe even a couple years older. Um, and then the guy who is the head of creative for the Richards Group today, which has the Motel 6 account, uh, his name is Chris. And uh, Thomas and Chris have both won the $100,000 Mercury Award for the nation, for the best radio ad in the whole nation for that year. Now, uh, Thomas won the very first one for when, when Tom Baudet sang the phone number. And this is back before they had an 800 number. He's, he's singing, you know, the original phone number. They had to actually pay to call and make your reservations. And then um, we talked about this for a while. And it was interesting because Chris said that he does the New York Times crossword puzzle every day. He's utterly obsessed with it. Did not surprise me in the slightest because real wordsmiths, play word games, some kind of word game or another. I don't do crossword puzzles, but I respect those people that do, or a Sudoku or whatever a person might like. But if it has to do with ideas and concepts and connecting, you know, things together and seeing patterns and relating and trying to figure out words, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to do. Uh, read poetry. Expose yourself to better words and more interesting combinations and you'll learn how to say things with higher impact more quickly. Now, the thought strolled across my brain, the white hot furnace of youth, and then I recognized that as the last mental image in the sequence. My new question was, remember, step two, where to begin? The first mental image would need to be vivid. I was going to end the white hot, surface of, the white hot furnace of youth. Ah, razor thin we now I need a verb. How would something move if it was razor thin? We edged. Ah, but what did we edge? It's time to add the magic of meter. Razor thin, we edged our way through the day. Blah, 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 the white hot furnace of youth. Need another verb. I need one that says reckless and unstructured, musical, frenetic, energetic, out of control, jamming. Razor thin, we edged our way through the day, jamming. Jamming what? I drew a blank, but I knew it had to be a single syllable because the balance of the meter somehow had made itself known. I'm looking at this, razor thin, we edged our way through the day, jamming this and cheeseburgers. 
into the white-hot furnace of youth. Mmm. But what did we jam with cheeseburgers? Fries? Too obvious. Cokes? Malts? Beer? Too wet. Liquids put out fires. Let's think about alliteration. Ch -ch 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 cheeseburgers. Razor thin, we edged our way through the day, jamming chips and cheeseburgers into the white-hot furnace of youth. Metabolism. I have no use for that phrase in the world other than nostalgia, reminiscence, feeling sorry for myself because it's so easy to gain weight and so hard to lose it these days. Magical realism. I cannot discuss magical realism without mentioning that one of my very, very brilliant business partners, a fellow named Jeff Sexton, is perhaps the top expert in the entire world on magical realism. It's a type of writing characterized by what a lot of people would call fantasy, except it's not a fantasy story. You see, um, fantasy is when you create a completely al al alternative world. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a trickle of blood, came out under the door, crossed the living room, went out into the street, continued on in a straight line across the uneven terraces, went down steps and climbed over curbs, passed along the street of the Turks, turned a corner to the right and another to the left, made a right angle at the Buendia house, went in under the closed door, crossed through the parlor, hugging the wall so as not to stain the rugs, went on to the other living room, made a wide curve to avoid the dining room table, went along the porch with the begonias and passed without being seen under Amaranta's chair as she gave an arithmetic lesson to Aureliano Jose and went through the pantry and came out in the kitchen where Ursula was getting ready to crack 36 eggs to make bread. Holy Mother of God, Ursula shouted. Specificity is the key. Now, Gabriel Garcia Marquez gave us some very good advice. If you say that there are elephants flying in the sky, people are not going to believe you. But if you say there are 425 elephants flying in the sky, people will probably believe you. 100 Years of Solitude is full of that sort of thing. 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, by the way, won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1982. <sighs> it isn't fantasy because it is this world. There is no alternate world, alternate race of beings. It's not science fiction or fantasy as in Lord of the Rings in Middle Earth. No, it's this world and the laws of this world and the relationships between people in this world and the geography of this world. And it's all very real and very objective and very true, except periodically something will happen. And he does it completely straight faced that you know is impossible and is a different impact. You see, it's not speaking to the logical, rational, deductive reasoning, sequential, linear, left hemisphere of the brain. No, 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 no. The right hemisphere doesn't know right from wrong. It doesn't know true from false. It's all about pattern recognition. Specificity is the key. The left brain, because it's detailed and specific, it doesn't seem like fantasy but the things that are happening are completely impossible and it moves you to the right hemisphere and you're caught in this weird shadow land between reality and imagination and it's a very powerful thing in advertising if you learn to get a grip on it and how to manipulate it. Now I find out from my partner Ray Sagarin he arranged, I think that, uh, boy forgive me if, if I'm miscalling the details here, I think the Louisiana State Broadcasters Association and a couple of other state broadcast associations based upon Ray Sagarin's recommendation. He's another of our partners. Um, he said, hey, if, if you want somebody to teach broadcast writing, you, you need to get Jeff Sexton. And so Professor Sexton, who literally did teach college, um, is going to be going, I think, not too many weeks or months from now, to teach a group of broadcasters about uh, a whole ton of different writing techniques, one of which will hopefully be magical realism. Now we're going to move for a moment into what I'm going to call the 12 stages of intimacy of Desmond Morris. Now you're probably going to write down the name Desmond Morris. He was a behavioral psychologist who had a question. And the question was, 
why do some married couples have a very strong bond and they stay happily married for a lifetime? And other people get married seemingly just as much in love and they grow apart and get divorced. Is there something about the one group that causes them to, to have a stronger bond and it's missing from the second group? And it's, it's an interesting question. And like any scientist, he, he had, you know, to test his, his theory. What he found was very surprising. Uh, you can Google this on your own, but it applies not just to relationships between human beings. And remember, I'm talking to you now about crafting long-term branding campaigns. Now, why would I talk to this differently than this idea of, um, when we were talking about guardian alarms, they said they need the freaking phone to wing ring right freaking now. They got, they got to have some calls or the advertiser is going to quit investing his money because calls are flat and trending down and we got to make a difference and do it today. God, that's a hard way to make a living making things happen right now. Pretty soon it gets tiresome. I'm too lazy to do that most of the time. But it actually is not just more fun, it's actually more of a challenge. And it's actually way more money to be made for the client and for the advertising consultant when you think long term, when you think 52 weeks a year. We want it to work better and better and better and better the longer we keep doing it. Ah, we want to develop relationships, strong bonds, intimacy. We want to be the people that they always have on their mind whenever they need what it is we do or sell. Involuntary automatic recall, deep connection. So yeah, what's true at the level of individuals, husbands and wives, is also true at the level of businesses, customer to brand. The thing that Desmond Morris found is there are 12 stages of relationship. And first is eye to body. This means one entity has become aware of the other one. And then they're eye to eye. They're aware of each other. Voice to voice. Now they're actually communicating. Hand to hand. Arm to shoulder. Arm to waist. Mouth to mouth. Now notice the progression. It's interesting because when you see the complete list of 12, it will occur to you that you can skip any one. You could go from one to three or from four to six. You could skip one and it would be a little bit jarring. But to skip two back to back, to go from one to four, or to go from three to six, to skip two would be assault. I mean, it would just be very, very inappropriate, even if you've been married for 30 years. So this progressive stages of intimacy, what Desmond Morris found was that when they go through the 12 stages in order, and they allow sufficient time at each stage, they take time for the relationship to, 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 to deepen and strengthen. They tend to stay happily married. And when you skip stages, which is what always happens in advertising, advertisers want to skip stages. They want to go straight from, I see a potential customer to number 12. And it just doesn't create a long-term strong relationship. Now, from number seven is number eight, hand to head. It's a very big deal to let somebody touch your head. Did you know that? And then there is hand to body, number nine, and then there's number 10, number 11, and number 12. Now, 10 days ago, I was at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. Believe it or not, opening act for none other than Celine Dion. That's right, Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas, last week. Actually, about 10 days ago. Not last week, it's the week before last. That's right. I was up on the stage doing my thing, made my presentation for an hour and 15 minutes, and then nine hours later, Celine Dion took the stage. Yeah, it wasn't exactly a warm-up act, was it? Now, I was there to make the presentation of a new national radio campaign. It'll be on in 35 different markets across the U.S. and Canada, representing 183 different franchisees. 
Now, I normally avoid companies that have franchisees because franchisees, everybody has strong opinions about marketing, don't they? I mean, everybody does. And if you're a franchisee, you, you, wanna, you, you kinda zero in on the marketing. So is everything there that needs to be there? Are they leaving anything out? Do I think this is gonna work? After all, part of this is my money and, you know, uh, and everybody has opinions. And if, you, if you're polite and you listen to everybody, you'll be as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. And so I'm allergic to that. As you know, I don't ever ask for anybody's feedback for, well, maybe because I'm an arrogant jerk, I don't know. But on the other hand, I think it was Bill Cosby who said, I, know, I don't know the secret of success, but I do know the, the key to failure, which is trying to please everyone. And so I don't usually work with companies that have a bunch of franchisees, but in this particular instance, the CEO, the founder of the company, is a very close friend of, of a long-term client of mine named Sean Jones. And Sean not only pays me a lot of money every month for the past several years, he um, is the single largest donor to Wizard Academy, many hundreds of thousands of dollars he has donated, and he doesn't even get any tax benefits because he's Canadian. And the Canadian government doesn't give you tax benefits for donating to American 501c3 nonprofit organizations. So when my friend Sean says, my buddy has never advertised. He built this company, powerful nationwide company. He built it with just public relations has never advertised, doing over $100 million a year and has never advertised. Wow. So I agreed to work with him, did an investigation, and here's the simple thing. You paid a whole lot of money for this stuff, and now your space is crowded, and you're going to pay a bunch of money to have this stuff hauled off. Now, if you, know, if you were going to use logic, it makes more sense to put it on Craigslist or eBay or have a garage sale or something, you know. But we don't want people to think that way. We want them to pay us to haul this stuff off. This is kind of like buying a diamond. It doesn't really make that much intellectual sense, frankly, if you think about it too hard. It really doesn't. I just want them to associate. What the, by the way, what would be the taste of the meat in the heart of the dog here? We need relevance and credibility. Relevance and credibility. Remember, relevance and credibility. And so, I created five or six ads that will run in sequence. And remember, the first thing I have to do is get eye to eye. We're aware of them. They're not yet aware of us. Eye to body. We see the customer out there. The customer doesn't yet see us. We need to get eye to eye. We need to become aware of each other. So the first ad is actually the weakest because it has to start just by explaining who we are and what we do. And then you'll notice I bridge off into some magical realism as the campaign continues, and the spokespersons gain a little bit more personality, and a little bit of a style guide emerges in this campaign. Now, what's interesting is, I always look for what I call an unleveraged asset, and in this particular company, I got my credibility from their unleveraged asset. And what it was, I mean, it's probably the best PR team on the planet, four people, um, that they don't go fishing for minnows, they go fishing for whales. I mean, every, I mean, 100% of the biggest name journalists, people whose opinion cannot be purchased, have openly endorsed this company and said, you really, interviewed them for free, put them on the show, put them in the newspaper, put them in the magazine, I mean, all the big ones. And I said, if I throw some of those out there, we're gonna have this astounding credibility. And I made sure that the client put on the home page, a link to this video that shows these really powerful spokespersons endorsing this company. I am tedious and pedantic when I say too much. I am mysterious and deep when I say too little. This is also true of you. Have you ever known someone who took too long to say too little? Have you ever been someone who took too long to say too little? Target the psychological environment. The psychological environment. Nothing affects the value of a home quite so much as its neighborhood. Realtors chirp it like little birdies on a branch. The three things that matter most are location, location, and location. Advertising's like that too. 
The psychological environment dictates how people are going to feel. Now, imagine you're watching a TV show that you've been waiting all week to see this episode. It's a brand new episode. It's not a rerun. You're following this show. You love this show. You feel good about this show. You're involved with this show. These are friends of yours. An ad comes on. You're going to feel differently about that ad than if the exact same ad comes on while you're sitting around, bored out of your wits, watching a soap opera, and you're just about to puke because you're irritated that the plumber hasn't showed up. He was supposed to be here two and a half hours ago. You'd hate this show, but there's nothing else to do. And so, yeah, same exact ad shows up in the middle of a soap opera that you feel very disconnected from, and it's actually not something you're happy about. You're in a weird place psychologically. Yeah, it isn't the ad, and it isn't even the fact that it's delivered on TV. The psychological environment is the overlay. It's the location, so, so to speak. What na what's the ad's neighborhood? What is around this ad? What is its neighborhood? Who are its neighbors? Now, the same thing is true on the radio. Since there's so many radio groups that have subscribed for this training, let's look at the difference between morning drive and afternoon drive. In the mornings, the listener isn't thinking about their private life. They're thinking about the day ahead. They're thinking about obligations and commitments and things they need to get done today. In the afternoon, when they're driving home, is when they think about family and friends and home. And so what's the psychological environment? I tend to prefer afternoon drive, frankly, because most of the people that I work with are dealing in the private, personal life not the business life of the listener. Psychological environment, same station, same relationship with the announcers and the music. Different psychological environment. Where's their head at when they're driving home? What are they thinking about as opposed to in the mornings? Rush Limbaugh. Boy, he stepped in it in a big way, didn't he? And everybody's trying to spin this. I mean, it's going to get way more bad, I'm telling you. Everybody's been acting like this isn't as big of a deal as it is. It's a huge deal. Because whenever Rush Limbaugh, 10 days ago or so, um, in the heat of the moment, he called the young woman a slut, and it, you know, it irritated a lot of people, and it was a little bit over the top, but he could have survived it. A lot of people think this is about liberals and conservatives. Oh, it isn't. It's about Rush Limbaugh and women. Because over the next couple days, he kept attacking this young woman, kind of unfairly, and then he finally said, you know, you're a prostitute and you need to make me a tape. Well, she wasn't a prostitute, and it was premeditated. And that was the moment, if you begin talking to women, whenever he really went too far, and then he had this very lame apology that just didn't work. And I'm going, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. We have a lot of clients advertising on Russia's show nationwide, and I started getting bombarded with emails. Wow, should we pull our ads on Rush? I mean, it was huge rage at the local level uh, coming back. And by the way, never got problems advertising on Rush all these years until he makes the statement, calls the woman a prostitute and says, make me a video. Um, and my answer was, number one, Rush has a huge audience. It's huge. That's the upside. The downside is, it's not always the right psychological environment for our message. So what the hell? Let's go ahead and yank it. Um, if we give up, we're not going to get as many viewers for the same money, or the same, as many listeners for the same money necessarily, but we're going to get a better psychological environment for selling romantic things like diamonds and romantic things. Now, if you're going to sell, I might have had a different attitude if uh, the Guardian Alarm people were a client, because Rush creates such a fear in the show that all of a sudden anxiety and fear are created. So it's bad for selling romantic products, but it's maybe very, very good for selling a crook is going to break into your house, he's going to do all these evil things unless you take action. Because that's kind of like where your head is at when you're listening to Rush. There's a lot of outrage and there's a lot of, you know, uh, things just aren't right and things need to be fixed and boy, you know, the world is screwed up. And so that sense of danger and impending whatever. Yeah, if that's the, the psychological environment, it might be the perfect place for something like a security system, but not for romantic stuff. And so, yeah, most of my clients pulled their ads on Rush and will probably stay off forever. Now, late nights. 
let's go back to romantic environment. Boy, girl, in the car together, running around Friday night, Saturday night. And if you're riding around in the back seat as a jeweler on every date they've ever been on for the past several years, and you're saying, hey, if you guys ever decide to get married, remember, you know, I'm in the engagement ring business. If they are always together when they hear your voice, I've been doing this for 30 years. It works phenomenally. Late night radio on stations that have a lot of people listening that are really young and out running around after dark. I mean, married people are at home watching Desperate Housewives and uh, Grey's Anatomy and House. But guess what? Late night on the weekends, not that many people listening to the radio compared to during the day, but boy howdy, they're all dating and they're together and the juices are flowing and there's a moment whenever talking about maybe staying together long term is really, they're very open to that. Smart realtors don't say, tell me about your house. Remember, we're talking about psychological environment. Smart realtors say, tell me about your neighborhood. Likewise, smart advertisers don't ask, who will we be reaching? Smart advertisers ask, how will they be feeling? What will be the psychological environment? Ah. It's not about who I'm reaching, it's about how they're feeling. It's 1989. A clean-cut, happy young man named Brian begins serving his community by hauling off junk. Hi. Junk from offices. Junk from attics and closets. Junk from garages and sheds. Everyone likes Brian. Everyone likes having a new, empty space. Brian recycles 50% more than he takes to the landfill. 61.3%. Brian hired two guys named Tom. And now we're nationwide. Wide. More than 1,000 young Bryans and Toms in 183 cities. Clean cut young men happy to haul away what you no longer want or need. Reclaim that spare bedroom, office, closet, or garage. Call 1 800 Got Junk and we'll be there before you hang up the phone. Visit us at 1 800 Got Junk.com. See the video of Oprah, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dr. Phil, and Sharon Osborne singing the praises of this happy little company. Let us haul away your junk and you'll be singing to 1-800-GOT-JUNK. The narrative arc is the sequence of e events, the plot, the action. The narrative arc tells us what happens. The character arc. Characters in fiction seem deep and interesting and real as a result of the things we discover about them as their character arcs unfold. You filled your garage with it. Uh, you walk around it. Oh, man. Step over it. Whoops. Put it into closets. Phew. And cram it in the attic. Oh, great. It's been there so long, you don't see it anymore. Bottom line, you've got junk. <laughs> We can help with that. Really? Call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We'll be there before you hang up the phone. We're the company Oprah told you about. And the New York Times. Dr. Phil. The Wall Street Journal. And Good Morning America. Call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Okay. Life is happier when it's less cluttered. Your house will be bigger. Your teeth will be whiter. Angels will sing. You'll be a better dancer. Go to 1-800-GOTJUNK.COM and prepare to be amazed. Great stories have character arc. As you get to know these spokespeople, the brand diamond emerges. We're talking about how to create a long-term ad campaign. We've only got a few more minutes, very few minutes. We're going to go quickly. Reaching a person once is cheap and easy. Reaching that same person a second and third time in the same week is expensive and difficult. 1-800-GOT-JUNK is a team of clean-cut young men named Brian and Tom. We just want to haul away your junk. You don't need it. You don't use it. You don't want it. Junk from your house. Your office. And your yard. It's been there so long, you don't see it anymore. But it takes up space. Lots of space. Let us haul it away. You'll feel like we added on a whole new room. Wow. We're the company Oprah told you about. The New York Times. Dr. Phil. The Wall Street Journal. And Good Morning America. Call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Life is happier when it's less cluttered. Your house will sparkle. Your car will get better gas mileage. The radio will play better music. You'll win the lottery. Go to 1-800-GOT-JUNK.COM and prepare to be amazed. 
Horizontal schedules. We talked about this last month. Ads that flow across the days of the week at approximately the same time each day in an attempt to reach the same listeners multiple times. When I talked about the ads for our client, Dewey Jenkins, the TV ads, always on in the late evening news, horizontally, day after day after day. That's a horizontal schedule on TV. You can get some repetition that way by targeting the show, not the station. Horizontal schedules make the advertiser part of daily life. They're just always there. What's a campaign? It's an extended series of ads that reveals the character and personality of the company. We'll make your house feel big and clean. We're 1-800-GOT-JUNK. You've got a much bigger house than you think. So big, it's going to blow your mind. Big and clean means no junk. No dead televisions. No rolls of carpet. No stacks of tires. No ugly appliances. No piles of leaves. No obsolete computers. And we sweetly recycle 50% more than we take to the landfill. We're the company Oprah told you about. The New York Times. Dr. Phil. The Wall Street Journal and Good Morning America. Join the in crowd. Call 1 800 Got Junk. You're going to like having a big, clean house. You'll walk through that house with a spring in your step and smile as you look in each room. Your house is going to be so big and clean, you'll whistle a happy tune. Go to 1 800 Got Junk.com and prepare to be amazed. Now, we're almost done. Remember, a character diamond determines how a character will think, act, and see the world. The brand diamond is created in the mind of the customer by connecting the dots of the defining characteristic of your company. You'll feel like we added on a whole new room. Wow. But all we really did was haul away your junk. We're 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Give us a call and you won't got junk no more. We apologize for the grammar. You'll have a big, clean living room. A big, clean office. A big, clean bedroom. A big, clean shed or garage. A big, clean any room you want. That's what I'm talking about. And we recycle 50% more than we take to the landfill. I like it. Where the company Oprah told you about. The New York Times. Dr. Phil. The Wall Street Journal. And Good Morning America. Call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. You're going to like having those big, clean rooms. You'll feel 25 years younger. And 20 pounds lighter. All right. The air will smell sweeter. The stars will shine brighter. Go to 1-800-GOT-JUNK.COM and prepare to be amazed. Now, this is actually an email that I sent the guys at 1-800-GOT-JUNK the day before I made my presentation to the franchisees in um, Las Vegas. Now, believe it or not, the, the company's headquartered uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's actually a Canadian company with a huge number of franchisees in um, the U.S. and in Australia. Now, I sent the email and pointed out that Zig Ziglar was fond of pointing out that while Black & Decker sells, you know, like 10 million quarter-inch drill bits every year, no one ever wanted a quarter-inch drill bit. They all wanted quarter-inch holes. Likewise, no one wants lawn fertilizer. They want green grass. I made them understand that big and clean, that's what's the taste of the meat in the heart of the dog. That's what our customer wants. They want space. We usually add about 200 square feet to the living quarters of the client. Somebody calls 1-800-GOT-JUNK, they're going to get 200 square feet added onto their home for very little money. Now, that's our benefit. That's what we're actually, that's our core selling proposition. That's what's in the heart of the dog. In this email, I said the Radio Spurks persons obviously think big, as evidenced by their over-the-top statements, but their exaggerations are always happy and clean. Positive, upbeat, optimistic, feel good. That's what we sell. Did you guys notice the magical realism? You know, we're talking about reality, but then all of a sudden your teeth will be whiter, you'll become a better dancer, you know, you'll win the lottery, the radio will play better music, your car will get better mileage. Consequently, I suggest we publish a book later this year. 1-800-GOT-JUNK is a team of clean-cut young men named Brian and Tom. And they want to give you a gift. It's a book. 
compiled by the boys of the company. It's filled with heartwarming stories, poems and quotes, and some of their favorite sayings. If this book was available in bookstores, it would cost one million dollars. He's exaggerating. Call 1-800-GOD-JUNK. We'll bring a copy right over. It's a book of big, clean stories, hopes, and dreams. While we're there, we'll give you an estimate on hauling away your junk. Everyone has junk. Where the company Oprah told you about. The New York Times. Dr. Phil. The Wall Street Journal. And Good Morning America. Call 1-800-GOD-JUNK. We believe the big, clean wisdom of Brian and Tom will be translated into every language of the world. You'll read it and laugh. You'll cheer. You'll overflow with hope for the future. Your house will sparkle. 1-800-GOT-JUNK.COM